welcome you to the Lighthouse in Cherry Tree, Pennsylvania, with founders and pastors Ken and Wilda Brown. And now, let's go into the service already in progress. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So therefore, Jesus is your anchor. The anchor is a spiritual or a symbol presenting salvation, steadfastness, steadfastness, belief, and hope, and faith in Christ. And I always go back to the word of steadfast. Too many of us are out there just floating around or flopping around. But it's time for us to put our, our feet on the solid rock of Jesus Christ and to be steadfast in his word. To know, because that's where your strength is coming from. Your strength is coming from Jesus Christ and from the word that he so willingly gave us to live on each and every day. In Psalms 119, 105, your word, otherwise the, your anchor, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And we sang about that this morning. So God's word provides illumination, the light to walk without stumbling. And that's where we want to get in our lives and our walk with Jesus Christ, is to a place that even if we do stumble, we quickly get back up on our feet. You know, people laugh and say, the older you get, you don't get up as quickly. Well, I'm going to say, no. Lord, help me, especially in the spiritual, when I, if I should stumble and fall, that you would help me to get back up on my spiritual feet quickly so that I am not taken out of your word, out of your life. And that's what happens to a lot of people. They stumble and they fall in their spiritual walk. And for some reason, they don't go and run to the Father or to the Word and say, Father, help me. Help me. Put your Word before me. Let it be the lamp to my feet and the light to my path. No, they, 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 go, they go down and they still begin to feel sorry for themselves. And then they go back into the world or they go right back to, to the same thing that they were caught up in. And that's, that's what the anchor here is all about, that we can, because God has given us that anchor. And some storms are brief, everybody know that? But some storms go on and on and on. Some storms we bring on ourselves. Some come from Satan himself. But we have, we still all have the word that can bring us through it, no matter who brought it on us, okay? So, but we got to stand in that strength. And I'm not reading this whole passage for time's sake, but Matthew 8, 23, we're going to just, through 27. Remember, and Jesus is asleep in the boat, while the disciples are alarmed by a powerful storm. Don't fall asleep in the word of God, because about the time you are not in your word, then that storm, that powerful storm is going to hit your life. And, the threat, and it was threatening to throw them all, all, not just one, not just two. But this storm was threatening to throw them all into the sea. The storm in this world is threatening God's people to destroy us. But I have news for Satan himself, and I have news for anybody that sits in that Senate, in the Congress. I don't know a lot about all of that. I only know the God that I serve. And I only know that he, that he said the, the storm was threatening to throw them in. And they awoke Jesus. And I believe that's where we are today. We're awakening the master. We're awakening Jesus. And we're, we're asking him for help, or you should be asking him for help. Because your help is not going to come from this world. So Jesus, what's he do? He rebukes the storm, and the disciples thank him. Sometimes we go through storms, and we come out on the other end, and we're like, yes, I made it. Hello? Hello? You called out to Jesus, and Jesus said, here I am. And he brought you through that storm. And you need to fall on your knees, as that song said. And you need to say, thank you, Jesus. We don't thank him enough. Every day we should be on our knees thanking him for what he has done, what he has brought us through. And most foremost is what he's about to bring you 
through. You don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know when a situation is going to happen in your family. And you're going to need to, Jesus to be right there on the helm of your boat and, and steering it. And, and you're, you just don't know. None of us. There's one of us here. And everybody could stand and, and give a testimony and say they've been through this. They know exactly what I'm talking about. Because when Christians know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and, and they're not playing the church scene, but they know Jesus within their lives, they can tell you exactly how he brought them through the storm and how he raised them up once again. In Matthew 14, 22, and 33... Where the disciples were in a boat here, in the middle of another frightening storm. And they saw Jesus walking on the sea. And Jesus commanded Peter to join him. And Peter also began walking on the water toward Jesus. So, such familiar passages, are they not? But we need to be reminded every day of the, what God, what Jesus has done. What God has done through Jesus. Because sometimes we forget. We forget when we get through storms that Jesus is your right-hand man. He will be right there for you. So the storm scared Peter just a little bit. How many ever got scared in the middle of their storms? How many got scared and tried to walk the other way or, or, or try their own thing? A lot, many of us have. Most of us have. I have. But, and he began to sink. You remember calling and he called out to Jesus to save him. And Jesus caught Peter by the hand and lifted him up as they got into the boat. When, Jesus, when Peter thought he was actually going to go down, when you think you're actually going to go down in your storm, reach out to Jesus, grab his hand, and I assure you, he will be grabbing yours. By faith alone, these disciples didn't know the outcome. They couldn't see what was going to happen. They didn't know that their, if their lives were going to be lost, it wasn't until their faith arose and Jesus was in that boat and he saved them all. All. I heard that this morning. All. So, but the church itself the, and people, people, we have fear a lot of times in our lives. I don't care who you are. You get that doctor report. You, you get that news that you're going to lose your home. You get that news that you've lost your job. And what sets in? Fear. Fear sets in. But during that storm, during that fear that Satan is trying to bring upon you through words of, of doctors, employers, government, especially government right now, People are beginning to run in fear again. Let, I wish they would take their stand in the God that can get them through this again. And not, not only through it, but bring them out on the other side victoriously. And in his strength. That's how we should be. When David, David did not run from his battle, he ran to his battle. But sometimes that's, that's how we are. We try to run and hide from things that are happening in our lives where we should be running toward that thing and, and standing on the word of God and saying, you, I'm not defeated, Satan, and in the name of Jesus, you have to go. We, but we got to believe what we're saying. I say that all the time. In Joshua 1, 9, God did not God say, have I not commanded you? He commands us. He's commanding us. Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wherever you go. I don't care where you are. You're in a hospital room. You're, you're in the darkest valley of your life. He's still there for you. He's there wherever you go. And three times God repeated these words. 
about do not be afraid, have courage, not be dismayed. And they were used to encourage Joshua. So that's what it's all about this morning. The song, the anchor holds, it was to encourage you that no matter what storm you face, that he's still there. Even if you don't even know what's going to happen on the other side of the storm, he's still there. So you still have to look unto him. And Paul, so in 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8, and this is Paul speaking. He, and I like this because he said, I have fought the good fight. We, we don't have time to mince words with, with, with our lives and, and how we're going to live for Jesus. We've got to stop playing the game because you need to fight the good fight. And, and you've got to keep on fighting. It doesn't end here because you got that bad report. It goes on because you said that my hope is in Jesus Christ and my healing is in Jesus Christ. And I will stand on that healing and I will stand on that hope no matter what comes. And I say that all the time, even with salvations of your families. I admonish you to not give up praying for them, to get on your knees and intercede for them. Because one day, one day you will see them in the house of the Lord and they will be serving Jesus Christ the author and the finish of their life. But if you don't keep in prayer, who else is going to pray for them? If you don't pray for the nation, who else is going to pray for them? We are being united together as churches, united together, not denominations, but people of Jesus Christ who know the God that they serve. And that God is going to bring us through this victoriously. You're going to see things happen in a few weeks that you never thought was going to happen because I serve a God that is the God of the impossible. The impossible. The report came that that this is it. We've done all we can do. But Jesus' report says, no way. I am here. I am your healer today. By his stripes, you've already been healed. By his stripes, you have already been delivered. You didn't know that you were going to come out of the drug and alcohol at that point in your life. But Jesus Christ delivered you. But you didn't know here that you were going to be delivered because you were so lost in that sin that you thought you would never come up out of it. But Jesus said, here, Take my hand, and I am bringing you up out of it. And because he has brought you up out of that, he is going to use you mightily, mightily in these last days. So here Paul is. He said, I've kept the faith. I think that's the most important thing, that you keep the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which, is the, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. All. You never know. This could be your hour. This could be your time here in the house of the Lord that the presence of the Holy Spirit will touch your life, that you will never be the same. You will never leave this place. You came in here one way, and you want to go out another way. Well, that choice is yours when you call upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and he touches your heart, and you will go out of here a different person. But that choice is always yours to take. So Paul persevered. He struggled, and he served God Till the end. And the crown of righteousness, it's a special reward given to those who serve God faithfully, faithfully on this earth. All who have loved his appearing are those believers in Christ who have lifted faithfully in the hope of his return. Are you looking for his return today? I am. But we need to keep the anchor of worship. We need to remain anchored to the church. Sometimes you begin to drift. But if you're anchored, you will feel the tug. You know, I think today that that tug is, is, I know it's the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. But so many of us have lost it. 
the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. The morals of the world have gone downhill big time. People do not see sin as sin. So they don't know that that tug is the Holy Spirit speaking to them once again, trying to get them back to the Lord Jesus Christ and know him as their personal savior. You're connected to the anchor. You should be connected to the anchor. Actually, everyone is connected. But a lot of people disconnect themselves from that anchor. They choose the way that they're going. And that's why we get in there and we get into intercessory prayer. And we can break the bondages that are, tug that are taking them out into the world. In Hebrews 6, 18 and 19, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. In verse 19, it says, this hope we have is an anchor of the soul, the hope, both sure and steadfast and which enters the presence behind the veil. The two immutable things are God's word and God's oath. Do you ever sit under oath? I tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. Well, he has given us these words and these oaths. But since God does not lie, and since he is all-powerful, he will fulfill all his promises. I'm looking for that day. That all these promises that he has said to myself personally, and a lot have come to pass, a lot. I've held the visions and I've held the dreams in my hands. And yes, some have slipped through. But this is the day that he is bringing the dreams and the visions forth once again in his people. We need to be ready to receive these visions and these dreams. We need to believe in the visions and the dreams that he's bringing to pass. The unchanging nature of God is the believer's consolation and encouragement. Right there it is. People have to be encouraged in the word. You, you need to encourage your brother and your sister that's, living, that's sitting beside you. You need to encourage them every day because people do get discouraged in, in the things of the world. The believer's hope in Christ is very secure. I always say about security. Everybody buys security cameras, security this, ADT, blah, 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 because to secure their homes. I'm secure in Jesus Christ. And this is the house that he is protecting against the things of this world. That when some, a storm comes against me or something happens in my, uh, in my life that I can't handle, he is the one that is securing me. I'm in that, I'm like that anchor. And the anchor, his anchor, the anchor's not secured in sand. Because what happens when the, when the water comes and washes that sand away? You're, you know, the anchor is no longer secured. Sand washes away. So you have to be secured in the word of the Lord. But in the very presence of the Almighty, and behind that veil refers to the most holy place, the place where God dwells. And I love dwelling in that place. I love feeling the presence of the Lord when you're in a time of worship and prayer. And you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the presence of the Lord is so powerful that things begin to happen in your life that you never thought was possible. But we need to learn how to row or steer your boat. Okay? The reason the boats have a rudder near the stem of it is so you can steer it. The reason you have Jesus in your life is so that he can steer your life. That he can secure you and let all your anchor, your, which means your hope, your faith, your peace, everything be in him. And the reason you have an oar, O-A-R, or should have an oar with you on a boat is so you can get to your destination. The reason this word has been prepared for you in this holy Bible is so you can get to your destination. What's your destination? heaven. Without this word and being a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, being born again, 
You can't get there. Okay? Same way, same way for the oar, okay? How many knows you need two oars to get that little canoe or boat around? I've never, I've never canoed, okay? So, but, uh, but if you lose both of those oars, and I heard it said here, I think, the other day in one of the, you're going to be up a creek without a paddle. <laughs> How's that even possible? It's not. You're not going to be up that creek. Because without them paddles, you're not going anywhere. Then I found this one to be really hilarious, and I pictured this in my mind. Because you ever picture something in your mind, and it's like, oh, that would be, that would be something to see, and I'd be rolling and laughing. It says, if you lose one of your oars, what's going to happen when you begin to... That's right, Carla. You're going to go round and around and around and around and around. And I think that's where a lot of people are today. They've lost their oar. If not both, they've at least lost one. And they're going in circles in their life. They're not finding the anchor that they should be anchored in. Because they're too busy going in circles. So where are you letting yourself be propelled today? Where are you letting yourself be propelled? Are you rowing, rowing in the circles? As a body of believers, we need to all be rowing in the same direction. So we're on this boat. And we all have two paddles. And we're rowing in the same direction. Because that's where Jesus Christ wants us to be. He, he don't want you to get lackadaisical on that boat and say, well... Nancy can row for me today. I'm just going to kick back. Yeah. How about a bicycle built for two? Pastor Ken and Wilda are on it. And she's in the back and she's going, hmm, he can just pedal this bike by himself. It, so what happens? He tires out and he can't figure out why. Because the person behind him isn't pedaling with him. She's expecting him to carry the load. And that's what's happening in a lot of churches and people's lives. They're expecting someone else to carry the load while they're still spinning in circles. Hmm. I want us all across the nation to begin to row in the same direction because when we begin to row in the same direction mighty things are going to happen our God's going to look down from heaven and he's going to be smiling on us saying look finally there's no confusion finally they are rowing in one direction and now I can come down there and I can begin to do what I said I'm going to do because my people are all in one accord. The same way it was in Acts 2, right? Hallelujah. In one accord. In one accord. And the great and the mighty thing happened. If you read the Acts two, chapter 2 and you begin to read it, then you know that things happen. You have to be where God wants you to be. you got to be doing what God has called you to do. And he hasn't just called me. He has called every one of you. So get in that boat. Get your oars in place and begin to row towards your miracle. Begin to row toward whatever you want changed in your life. I can't change it. These pastors of this house can't change it. The only one that can change it is your faith and your belief in Jesus Christ. That's the only one. that, that You're the only one that can change your life through Jesus Christ. Okay, so we're going to talk about Paul and the tempest. and That's in Acts 27. I'm not going to read it for time's sake. We're just going to review it because everyone in this house, I know, has read this over and over. Paul warned them this voyage would end in disaster and much loss. We already knew when the wrong president got in the house that we were in for disaster and much loss. Now, 
you go, well, then why did God permit it? I wish I could answer that, but I'm not God. But Paul did the same thing. He was trying to warn these, pe warn these people. Hey, hmm, much disaster and loss is going to happen if you take this voyage. But nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship. So he took their advice instead of the man of God's advice. Then the storm came. Paul's advice was given from his experience of being shipwrecked two other times. You know, this wasn't nothing new to him. But who am I to say? Anybody like that in here? Somebody tries to say, hey, been there and done that before. You may not want to do that. You might want to go this other direction. I've been there and done that. So they used cables to underguard the ship. They were trying to tighten it up. But nothing was working. And they began to lighten the load with their own hands. They were taking stuff off the ship. I think today, many Christians need to take some of this junk off of their ship and begin to toss it overboard. Hmm? I have a few things of my own I could toss out. So I'm going to begin to toss it out because I want to be rowing in the same direction as everybody else because I want to see the great and the mighty things come to pass. But only you can lighten your load of your sins or whatever is hindering you, your walk with the Lord. Get rid of of the junk. And by the way, they did drop four anchors from that ship. Get rid of the voice of insufficiency or I can't do it. I'm not good enough. What? Of course you're good enough. Jesus Christ is controlling, should be using your life. And if he made you, then you're good enough. Why? Because he chose you. He chose you. But so many people are insecure, in, and you think you're insignificant. That I'm just, I'm just a housewife. I'm just a grandmother. I'm just this. I'm just that. And he's up there going, I made you, my son, my daughters. I made you. My word is implanted in you. Now, get it off your boat. Get the insecurities off your boat, get the insufficiency off your boat, and get the insignificance that you feel off of your boat. So after a long time, Paul urged them to eat. They weren't eating. And I think that's happened to a lot of Christians. You're not eating. You're not eating this word every day of your life. You need it every day. No matter how you feel in the morning, you need that word. So he's telling them, eat, eat. We need to eat the spiritual food in order to be maintained, our life to be maintained in Jesus Christ. Then an angel of God came to Paul, and he said, do not be afraid. Paul had been given absolute assurance by the angel of God. You hear me? He was given absolute assurance, not by man, but by the angel of God. Do not be afraid. He's telling a lot of us today, for the things that are coming upon this earth, do not be afraid. Because I assure you that I am all-powerful, and I am the all-knowing God, and that no one will be lost on this ship. And because of what Paul said, the soldiers stopped the sailors from leaving the ship. And everyone made it to shore alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to make it to heaven. I'm going to make it to heaven. Because I am standing firm on the word of God. So God fulfilled his purpose and promise through the warnings of Paul. He still fulfilled it. Do you understand? Even though Paul gave the warning, they didn't heed it. They had to go through the storm, but God still fulfilled his purpose and promise through the warnings of Paul and the choices of the soldiers. They may, it ended up wrong decision in the beginning. See, you can always come back. 
People, that's where people lose it. They think because they sin, they're bad people. I've sinned. You have no idea what I've done in my life. God will never forgive me. Hogwash. He will forgive you. He, actually, he's already forgiven you. You are the one that needs to begin to forgive yourself of things that you think that God can't forgive you of. And until you do, no, you won't walk where God wants you to walk. If you can't encourage yourself to, and know yourself that God has called and chosen you, you're not going to be doing the things that God has actually called you to do. And that's, you know, you'll just be doing whatever. And sometimes it's okay if that's where you want to be. But I want to be in the Lord stronger than ever before, in his presence, in his word. I want to know his word from, from beginning to end and in between. I want to read about the powerful things that he does, that he has done. I want to read about the healings and the deliverances that he brought people through. But you got to read, you got to open this book in order to know. And God will fulfill, fulfill his promises when you make the right choices in your life. Because uh, a, boat, a boat will capsize. Once again, I've never been in a boat that capsized. I've seen people up on a river and they flipped over. And I'm just like, well, you know. So they capsized. If not properly anchored, you will capsize in your life. You will go under in your life if you're not properly anchored in Jesus Christ, if you don't know him as your personal savior. And I know a lot of us, we're, sometimes we're pretty smug when we sit here in the house of the Lord. We're like, well, she's not talking to me. The Holy Spirit's not talking to me because I'm that perfect Christian. I'm that perfect person that's walking on the earth right now. I always tell you, if you're perfect, you're not going to be here. I tell you, I tell my husband that when he looks at me and says, well, I'm perfect. And I always say to my husband, if you're perfect, you'd be sitting at the right hand of God right now. <laughs> and, you know, No, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect at this point until we reach the other side. And we're not even going to care. We're just going to be like, hey... I made it to heaven. Jesus Christ forgave me of all my sins. He blotted out everything that I thought was holding me back from making it into heaven. He took it upon himself when he went to that cross and he died for me. He died for my sins, my sins. And so don't be capsized. Don't let your boat be capsized. Be anchored properly in the Lord. When I say properly, I say that because I see, I hear, and talk to a lot of people that they are Christians. They say they're Christians. And, and from their actions, I have to say, okay, okay. And, and, you know, and that's all I say, okay. And then, you know, you just, you be, I pray for them. I pray for them because I don't want them to be so fooled by the things of this world that are being brought out and taught to people, our children, that this is okay. This, you know, I don't want them, I don't want to say this is okay. I want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is not okay. The word of God says that you, you're to be a holy people and a peculiar, peculiar people. What's, what's peculiar? I'm different than you are. Who do you think you are? In myself, I'm nobody. But in Jesus Christ, I'm a priest in the house of the Lord. He said that. He said it. I did. And I'm honored to hold that position. And I'm thankful to be able to hold that position. And I want to encourage people that... They can hold this position also when they know Jesus Christ, when they know the God that loves them, when they know the God that will take them by the hand and bring them up out of that miry clay, bring them up out of that alcohol situation, bring them up out of that lesbianism, bring them up out of 
drug addiction or any other addiction that's holding them. I want them to know that this Heavenly Father that we know within this house is also the same Heavenly Father that can take them by the hand and embrace them and let them know how much He loves them. It isn't a matter of how much I love you. It's a matter of how much Jesus Christ. I didn't go to that cross for them. I didn't go to that cross for you. Jesus Christ went to that cross for you. And it was His blood that ran down that hill that day that cleansed each and every one of their sins. And all also healed their bodies. And I'll say this every time from this pulpit, if I have to, that all the diseases of this world have got to go back to hell because Jesus Christ didn't give his life for nothing. The blood was the proof that the diseases are healed. And you say, well, they're not all healed. And I wished I could answer that question as to why they're not, but I can't. I can only tell you that he is the healing God today. If you believe, and I say this all the time, that, that if you walk in that healing, and I'll share this real quick. It's a quick testimony. And Brother Rick here can, to, can verify that. Wednesday night, we had the most powerful service of healing in this house that I've known. And, and I'll tell you right now, I don't like being sick. I don't like to hurt. And I was angry when, when four weeks ago, somehow I hurt my back and I could barely get dressed. I couldn't even, one day I got up, I couldn't even dress myself. You know those old pinchers someone gets you when you get old? Well, my sister got me a pair and said, here, use these. I said, what do I need those for? This was two years ago. So this come upon me. I couldn't dress myself. So I had to go to the closet that I threw them old things in, and I dug them out so I could pick up my clothes to put them on because that's how bad I was hurting. So every night I would go to bed, and, and I would say, hey, God, what's happening? What's happening? You know, and why am I still this way? Why am I still hurting? Why is this happening to me? He said, well, aren't you the preacher that gets up and says, walk in your healing? Oh, I said, yes, yes, I am. So I began to walk every day. And I'm not going to say I didn't make two, three trips to the chiropractor to get to see. Because I just needed so he began to work on me, and I said to him, what's the best thing I can do to get over this? I said, I'm not wanting to be down on my back or sitting in a chair. I said, I don't have time for that. He said, walk. <laughs> am I walking in my healing? Yes, I am. Because God opened my eyes, made me see that if you're going to preach it, you better walk it. Hmm. You better know what you're saying from that pulpit. You better know that the truth is in Jesus Christ. That when he says that you're healed, then you're healed. That, but that's his truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No other life but Jesus Christ. In order to have that anchor, though, you've got to know him. And I want to do a quote from Corey Ten Boom. Everybody, anybody familiar with Corey Ten? She wrote *The Hiding Place*, a powerful book. And her quote was: "In order to realize the worth of the anchor, we need to feel the stress of the storm." So, in order to know your, in order to know who your anchor is, you got to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And that's that's all of our goals in this house today. That as we row together and we pray for the souls of this world that need Jesus Christ, that need deliverance, that he, we know that he is the anchor to all of this. So throw out your worship, worship to him, out to him, because you're anchoring that worship in him. Throw out your intercessory prayer to him. Because the omnipresent which is the presence of God everywhere at the same time. He's everywhere. He's not just here. He's everywhere. Believe it or not, churches all across this nation are beginning to unite because people know exactly what's happening. They know that the end time is coming. 
And that if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, yes, he is a God of love. He is. But he is also a God that expects you to walk holy and pure before him. And if you don't, there's one other place left for people that refuse to acknowledge who God is. And that's hell. And people don't say it enough. They don't say it from the pulpit. I don't know if they're afraid to say it. Should we say it? Why wouldn't we? It's in the word of God. And that's his warning, by the way. Paul had the warning. He gave it. They didn't heed, but made it through the storm. The warning has been given time and time again from preachers all over the nation that there is a heaven and a hell. And Jesus Christ does love you. And he wants to see you delivered from the things that so easily beset you. And because of that love, it can be done. But you have to step up and make that choice. Because he's calling today to many in that world because the intercessors are praying. And God is honoring the intercessory prayer that's going forth. And he's beginning and already speaking to the many hearts this, this day, today, as we sit in this house, his word is going forth and touching lives today. So you have to know that. You've got to believe that. See, the whole thing is you've got to believe what you're saying. You know? When he said, walk in your healing, when I say walk in your healing, I had to walk in my healing. I had to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. But sometimes it, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do. So the omnipresence is the presence of God everywhere at the same time. See, he's not just like a small God that we put in a box and hold up for the next day. He's always and forever out there moving among. How, how do you think, why do you think that many times you say, wow, look what God did. You didn't expect it, but it happened. How much more would it happen if we expected it? Daniel expected to be saved from the lion's den. He went in there as calm as a cucumber, according to the word of God. He laid on those lions and took a little nap. Are you expecting? After I figured it out, I began to expect God to heal me. When he spoke to me and said, oh, man, hello, I said, yes. Oh, I know, I know. I know what I said. You've got to walk in it. You've got to walk in it. And Satan even tried to tell me, don't put them high heels on today. You'll throw your back up. And I said, watch this. And I went to the closet and put my high heels on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Don't you tell me, Satan, what to do and not to do. Because the word of God tells me exactly what I can say back to you. You were destroyed a long time ago. And you're, I say it, you're just too dumb to lay down. And a lot of reason being is people keep giving him credit. He ain't getting no credit from me. Because I know the God that I serve. And he's for me. He's not against me by any means. He strengthens me. In Philippians 4.13, my favorite scripture. I, me, Cindy, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's as where my strength has always come from. I'm going to be closing. And I know our sister sang a powerful song. But there's a course, and uh, it's called, I've, I've Anchored in Jesus. I don't know if we know that course here this morning. If it's in your songbooks, you're able to play it. But this is another anchored song. And I just, I want you to be anchored in Jesus Christ and the hope and the peace and the healing and all he has to offer. He has more to offer than anybody else could offer you. 
more than Medicare can offer you. <laughs> That's what they say. Look what I can offer you. Look what I can save you. God can offer it all to you, and he can save your soul. If this broadcast has been a blessing to you, we invite you to watch a new service every Sunday evening at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Watching on Facebook, please click the like button and leave a positive comment. And please, share with others. YouTube watchers, please subscribe and hit the notification bell. Help spread the good news of Jesus Christ.